Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Episode 60. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you. Before we get started, this is not a children's story. Yeah, Dad would make up stories when I was a little kid and tell them just kind of on the fly. Um, The Sewer Monster uh, was like one of my favorite characters. And it's funny because I remember like wanting to hear uh, repeats of some of the Sewer Monster stories. And... um, well, he was making them up on the fly, so he couldn't, like, remember them weeks later. Uh, tell me the one about the sewer monster when he fill in the blank. And Dad would just have to, like, make up a different story, which, you know, I knew was another sewer monster story. But, yeah, eventually it was just like, well, I'm making these up. So, um, that, uh, yeah, I don't know why. I just thought they would be, like, cataloged in his head the way that The Hobbit was cataloged between pages or... Um, uh, a light in the attic was in print in the same way. Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T U-verse Channel 99. I'm going to guess that um, uh, this, this, so this, this is called a novella, so it's longer than a short story, shorter than a novel. Uh, I'm going to guess that um, we are going to do this in... Um, let's say between five and seven parts, tonight being part one. This book is called Unstable Geniuses, a novella by Neil Ackerman. Copyright 2019 under the title Vladimir Frisbee's Revenge, Neil Ackerman, Smashwords Edition. Author's note, This book may not be used for commercial use without the permission of the author. Incidental note, we have permission of the author, most notably because Neil Ackerman is my dad. Hi, Dad. Chapter 1. Vladimir Frisbee. Arizona. For the third time in seven days, Vladimir Frisbee sat alone on his aging jet boat, the Nostromo. The engine had quit and left him stranded on Lake Powell. With a beer in hand and a dozen empties scattered about him, he waited for some kind soul to tow him back to the landing. Feeling maudlin, he talked and reminisced as if speaking with a childhood friend on the friend's deathbed, and in a way, it was. The old man's life revolved around three things. Beer, fish, and the Nostromo. <laughs> I, I love that the boat is named the Nostromo, by the way. It's just... Ah, I love that name. In her glory days, when the Nostromo inspired envy and Richard Nixon was president, she was the queen of both lake and river. However, styles change, paint peels, and iron rusts. In all things, beauty fades. In 1970, the world was a perfect place, at least in young Vladimir's eyes. His boat was new, and the country was in good hands. Frisbee first sensed trouble in 1972 when Congress overrode Richard Nixon's veto of the Clean Water Act, a clear example of government overreach. Shortly thereafter, Vladimir was ticketed for letting one fly over the side of the Nostromo and thus sending a turd on its way down the Colorado River 
replicating the historic journey of John Wesley Powell's 1869 exploration of the Grand Canyon, but with all, uh, without all the fanfare and sanitation. It was this initial run-in with a park ranger that established a pattern that would follow Mr. Frisbee for the next half century and beyond. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Trouble was never far behind Vladimir Frisbee. Born into an upstanding Flagstaff family of evangelical Lutherans, poor Vlad did not live up to expectation. While his siblings carried babies, Vladimir Frisbee navigated life with a beer in one hand and a fishing pole in the other. Without either, he tended to produce a stream of malevolent mumble passing judgments, inciting neighbors, and provoking those who had the effrontery to disagree with him. It was said of him that he could start an argument in an empty room, and in real arguments with real people, when confronted by the truth, facts are for losers, may as well have been his refrain. The Frisbee family's association with Flagstaff's St. Omar's Lutheran Church went back to 1890, when Vladimir's great-grandfather, Adolphus Frisbee, was appointed St. Omar's first and longest-serving pastor. After three generations, Vladimir had little in common with his revered ancestor. It can be truly said that the expression, an apple never falls far from the tree, does not pass every test. Life turned sour for Vladimir when he lost his cushy landfill job. He had put in 15 years with C&E sanitation and blew it by getting into a scrape while visiting south of the border. He spent one month in a Nogales jail. After that, he jumped from job to job, never sticking with anything for more than a year. Vladimir thought that he could do no wrong, and if things did not go his way, well, he would insist that he was in the right, and that the cards had been unfairly stacked against him. For example, his interview in front of a panel, a panel consisting of two students, two teachers, and a principal for a teacher's aide position lasted less than two minutes. In the space of those two minutes, he managed to fit in the word f three times. But, admirably, he said damn only once. It's not as if they hadn't heard the words before, he thought as he stomped out of the administration building. There was the instance when he lost his Sunday bus driving job for St. Omar's. Despite his sketchy driving record, they had originally hired him on the strength of his family name. Because his own truck was in for repairs, he drove the church bus to a strip club and parked it in a prominent location directly under a sign, The S*** Factory Topless Dancers. For reasons he did not understand, the church elders took exception and stripped him of the keys. What's the big deal? He asked concerning the strip club. The way he saw it, his visits to the thought factory represented a form of altruism. Flagstaff was a university town and many of the dancers were students. He considered the money he stuffed in their G-strings to be contributions to their college funds, not far removed from others who are praised for endowing scholarships. He, on the other hand, encouraged students to earn their money. In Vladimir's own words, work's important. It builds in character. As a valued slut factory customer, <laughs> the old man had become an excellent judge of pole dancing technique. Plus, he was more than willing to pass on his expertise to the novice dancers. A drunken Vladimir once philosophized to a 19-year-old co-ed pole dancing, if done right, 
It's damn good exercise. I know people at the university. I could pull some strings, get you some PE credits, but the strings that Vladimir promised to pull existed only in his alcohol-addled mind, and nothing was ever done. Nevertheless, he saw potential in declaring the slap factory an annex of Northern Arizona University. Aligning it with the Department of Physical Education, he even imagined becoming a university adjunct and being placed in charge of student evaluations and the assessment of college credits. And one evening, after having run up a sizable bar tab, he mulled over rechristening the strip club. The Vladimir Frisbee Center for the Dancing Arts had become his first choice. The name had a ring to it and would lend the venerable institution that degree of respectability that it currently missed and perhaps get back his bus driving job in the process. Frisbee could not and would not bend to the will of others and be molded into someone else that he was not. There was only one Vladimir Frisbee. And some said this was a blessing. As Vladimir pondered life while stranded on Lake Powell, he began to face the cold, hard truth. The Nostromo was nearing her final journey, a resting place in the Pleasant Valley scrapyard. It was a fact that he could admit only to himself. If someone else weighed in on the matter, a line would be crossed, and he'd see their negative opinion as fighting words. On the verge of tears, Vladimir decided he would patch her up and take her for one last run on the rapids below Lee's Ferry in the upper reaches of the Grand Canyon National Park. An attempt to resurrect those glory days when she would turn heads by skimming across the water. Just slicker and shit, as Vladimir Frisbee was given to say. Chapter 2 The Final Voyage One week later, the wiry, sunburnt Frisbee had launched his boat, drove truck and trailer up on high ground, and turned in time to watch her sink. The action drew a crowd of wizened fishermen from whom issued many catcalls and concluded with a cruel round of applause. Things became testy when park ranger Dale Chumley explained to the irascible captain of the Nostromo the nature of his many infractions and wrote the weather-beaten fishermen three citations. The hapless ranger was working on citation number four when he was cold-cocked with a boat oar, an intentional act which precipitated a second round of applause. An ambulance delivered the ranger to the hospital while Vladimir spent that night and the next as a guest of Coconino County, a place where he was well known. He had many friends amongst those dressed in orange and would have enjoyed the reunion if the facility had served beer. On the day of his arrangement, Frisby, Frisby, trussed up like Hannibal Lecter, appeared in a restraint chair. Using language known to reliably peel paint from the walls, he, peeled, he pulled no punches and made his opinions known to Judge Grayson Webster, who, citing contempt, added five days to the two Frisbee had already served. As the jailers wheeled the defendant out of the courtroom, Vladimir made several threats. One threat in particular was directed toward the bandaged park ranger who had been present to ensure that justice was done. Two weeks later, Vladimir's jury trial. The headline read, Local fishermen in trouble again. The article in the Flagstaff Daily Spew went on to state, According to heated testimony provided by Grand Canyon National Park Ranger Dale Chumley, 
The Nostromo was cut in half and half out of the park when she sank. Besides, that piece of junk should not have been anywhere near the water in the first place. Just an accident waiting to happen. Upon hearing Chumley's hateful words, Vladimir, who was quick and agile for a 75-year-old, jumped to his feet and vehemently objected, I was nowhere near the goddamn park. That f***ing ranger's lying. You can't trust any of them to tell the truth. Anyway, he don't know one good thing about boats. All I gotta say on the matter. With that, Frisbee, who had chosen to represent himself, rested his defense. The jury found Vladimir Frisbee guilty so fast that its members barely had enough time to enjoy a cup of coffee. In hindsight, Vladimir considered that consuming his customary rise and shine breakfast, which on that morning consisted of eight beers and a piece of toast, might have been a mistake. The judge ordered Vladimir to serve 30 days in jail, pay fines, and make restitution, attend tolerance training boot camp, and perform 280 hours of community service. 280 hours, no f***ing way, the defendant moaned loudly. However, in four and a half months, Vladimir would discover that his stint of community service would be a stroke of luck at the beginning of a great adventure. Chapter 3 Park Ranger Dale Chumley Flagstaff, Arizona. Dale Chumley paid money to Ancestors.com and learned only that he was descended from a long line of In his opinion, it was not money well spent. He was quite good at making poor choices and did so frequently. For instance, as noted earlier, Dale had turned his back on the Nostromo's surly captain, the oblivious Chumley, hummed as he rode away on his pad of citations and took no notice as Vladimir Frisbee took a couple of practice swings with the boat oar. Another moment Dale Chumley regretted was marrying Wilma Dinkelman. All who knew them gave the union little chance for success. One witness to the joining of these two mismatched souls was her older brother and only sibling, Harley. Their father had bowed out years before, leaving the Dinkelman family rudderless. Consequently, Harley took it upon him himself to guide and protect Wilma, and felt it his duty to give special scrutiny to the mail company that she kept. In lieu of a bachelor party, Harley Dinkelman brought Dale a beer and offered his future brother-in-law some marital advice. I'll f***ing kill you if you ever lay a hand on her. You understand me, bro? Harley Dinkelman played rugby, so inflicting pain on others came quite naturally for the big man and normally normally brought a smile to his face. On Dale and Wilma's second anniversary, Dale sat alone at the bar in Flagstaff's Red Dog Saloon. He'd finished beer number seven and was about to order another when a young man sat next to him. He ordered his eighth and the lady leaned in close and said to the bartender, I'll have the same. Having given the woman a bleary-eyed glance and having liked what he had seen, Dale offered gallantly, hey, You can put that on my tab. But what Ranger Chumley did not see was his brother-in-law staring daggers in his direction. Dale clumsily slipped off his wedding ring and put it in his pocket. Across the room, his back to the wall, Harley emitted a low growl.
When Sonia Davenport entered the Red Dog, many heads turned. Attractive, well-endowed, and dressed to draw attention, she looked for a male sitting alone, someone oafish and not too bright. Spotting Dale Chumley, her first thought was perfect and plopped down next to her intended victim. It was Friday night and payday for many. The upshot was this. After a few more drinks, and after Sonia began rubbing his thigh, Chumley proposed that they go for a ride in his truck. I know the perfect place, Sonia said in a voice that dripped honey. When they left the Red Dog, Harley Dinkelman happened to be in the men's room, otherwise he would have followed. Sonia's perfect place was down a lonely road five miles out of town. How'd you find this spot? Sonia ignored Dale's question and instead began to strip. Before he could turn off the engine, she'd taken off her top and was jiggling her tits just inches from his nose. Dale raced to remove shoes, socks, shirt, pants, and underwear, job done, and fearing that his full bladder might diminish both his performance and his pleasure, he excused himself. I really need to take a piss. All that beer, you know. <laughs> totally naked, Chumley stepped away from the truck. Thirty seconds later, he met Sonia's partner. Introduced only to the large man's fist, Ranger Dale rolled down an embankment. A minute later, having crawled out of the ditch that he had tumbled into, Dale Chumley witnessed his truck, including clothing, wallet, and wedding ring, speeding toward the highway. Using two leafy branches to cover front and rear, he attempted to flag down cars, but not one of them stopped. He'd walked five miles before Chumley somewhat reluctantly accepted a ride from a Coconino County Sheriff deputy. The Flagstaff Daily Spew, that's the name of the Flagstaff gossip paper, the Flagstaff Daily Spew made a big deal out of the robbery, placing Dale's story on the front page, inserting it between a report on the economic recovery and an article chronicling a cockroach infestation in a local restaurant. The unwanted notoriety was enough to end his already rocky marriage. Wilma filed, papers were served, and the divorce was granted. Obsessed with the lottery, Dale had, for years, wasted a minimum of $100 weekly, but with only middling results. It had been a major obstacle in their marriage, and would start arguments and inspire Wilma to lecture on the subject of fiscal responsibility. After the divorce, and without Wilma there to object, Dale Chumley doubled down, and as luck would have it, his persistence paid off. He hit a winner, 10 million, and the spiteful Dale Chumley decided to wave the news in his ex-wife's face. Taking a selfie, his face full frame and holding the winning, winning ticket chin level, Dale texted the picture with this message. Take a look, bitch. 10 million bucks. Too bad you don't get any of it. <laughs> Having grown up with a large, mean, overly protective brother, Wilma did what she'd been doing all of her life. She ran to Harley, and at his insistence, forwarded him Dale's text message. Her rugby-playing brother got his gun, drove to the Red Dog Saloon parking lot, and waited in the truck. Dale staggered out around 11 p.m. He walked around to the side of the building and began pissing in the shadows. Pressing his gun against the back of Dale's head, Harley said, Don't you f***ing turn around, you slimy piece of sh Where's the lottery ticket? Dale did not immediately answer. Reasonably certain that Harley would not pull the trigger, he made several moves, all of them slow, methodical moves, 
designed not to threaten or to arouse suspicion. First raising his right hand, he slipped something into his shirt pocket. Next, he shook off his pants and zipped up his pants. He then turned around slowly while wiping his hands on his pants and said nonchalantly, What lottery ticket? The one you texted Wilma. Well, you know her better than I do. She must have made up a story. I've been going to Gamblers Anonymous meetings. Haven't bought a ticket in months. With one hand holding the gun, Harley dug for his phone with the other and began searching for the text to shove in his ex-brother-in-law's face, at which point Dale Chumley made another horrific blunder. Taking advantage of Harley's momentary distraction, he grabbed for the gun. The gun fired, the bullet entered Dale's skull and lodged in the parietal lobe after passing through his frontal lobe. Chumley slumped to the ground and died. Wilma's brother remained cool. He looked around. No witnesses. Casually walking back to his truck, he drove to the side of the building, found Dale's wallet, which he put in his pocket, loaded the body into the bed of his pickup, and later dumped the dead man off a bridge into a dry wash several miles northeast of town. Arriving home just after midnight, Harley opened a beer and sat down to rifle through Chumley's billfold. Besides money, IDs, and a business card from a Nevada horse, he found a winning scratchers ticket amounting to a $30 payout and won the pick lottery ticket, which he assumed was the big winner. He put two things on his to-do list for the next day. Cash in the tickets and get rid of both wallets and gun. In the morning, he grabbed gloves and a shovel and drove to a wooded area northwest of town. When retrieving the shovel from the bed of his truck, Dinkelman spotted a cell phone next to the shovel. Damn. Must be Dale's. Better get rid of that, too. He buried gun wallet, and phone deep in the woods. The lottery ticket was another matter. Only a $400 winner. Harley then compared the numbers on the ticket Dale had texted Wilma with, with the actual winning numbers posted for that week. God, that sleaze really did have it. $10 million. Vaguely recalling that Dale had slipped something into his shirt pocket before reaching for the gun, Harley jumped in his truck and headed out of town. A quarter mile from the bridge, he spotted a country van and a half dozen men wearing safety vests and picking up trash. He slowed as he neared the bridge, ready to pull over, and that is when he spotted Vladimir Frisbee, picking his way into the wash not thirty feet from Dale Chumley's dead body. Dinkelman knew Frisbee, having shared the same cell with the man on two occasions. The last thing he saw before driving off was Vladimir turn and head towards the body. God, Frisbee, you rotten son of a bitch. Convinced that all was lost, Harley drove to the Red Dog, where he spent the rest of the afternoon. Chapter 4. Vladimir Frisbee's Lucky Day. Eight weeks of tolerance training boot camp did little to diminish that Vladimir Frisbee's hatred of park rangers. The experience pushed therapist up a notch on his most hated list, causing it to leapfrog lawyer, but leaving it well behind Park Ranger, which remained in top position. Frisbee hung on to his prejudices like a barnacle clinging to a rock. In his opinion, boot camp graduation was a farce. Ranked last in his class, Vladimir Frisbee sauntered across the stage like a truculent five-year-old. 
Community service consisted of climbing into a van with five like-minded felons, putting on a yellow safety vest, grabbing a garbage bag, and filling the bag with trash, of which there seemed to be no end. Frisbee's daily excursions with trash bag in hand caused him to amplify his usual stream of blasphemous mumble, elevating it to the level of babble. He had no heart for the task, and probation services agent Clive Bush did nothing to improve group morale. Reminding Vlad of the warden in the movie Cool Hand Luke, Bush spent most of the day smoking cigarettes while treating everyone like dogs. Every day was the same, except the last day, Friday the 13th. His lucky day. The day that would change Vladimir Frisbee's life forever. Clive Bush had parked the van in a treeless part of the county, and those on trash detail spent most of that shift not far from the water cooler. However, not wanting to be too closely scrutinized, Vladimir wandered off by himself. The temperature had pushed well into the 90s and not a cloud in the sky. Soon, Vladimir was desperate to find relief from the heat. Around a bend, a bridge crossed a dry wash, and Frisbee headed in that direction, hoping to go unnoticed in the shade under the bridge. When twenty yards away, he spied a large lump. And stepping closer, discovered it was a body. Rather fresh, he mused, and... Since there was a bullet hole in the dead man's head, checking for a pulse seemed a waste of time. Because his fine and restitution because his fine and restitution order left him with a sizable debt, he checked for a wallet instead. Damn. No wallet. Frisbee looked closer at the man's face, and thinking that it looked familiar, rolled the body over onto its back. Well, I'll be god. But if it isn't Ranger Dale Chumley. Why? You write the wrong guy a ticket or something? Then afterwards, bitch about his boat? No, nothing, son of a... Even after four and a half months, Chumley's brutal testimony still churned in Frisbee's brain. The old man blamed the Ranger for his current set of troubles. It was, after all... Chumley's head that got in front of Vladimir's boat oar. Standing above the body, Vladimir began to think. I threatened to kill this bastard, and a deputy and two jailers heard me. Damn it. Probably makes me the prime suspect. It was then that Frisbee spotted a lottery ticket sticking half out of Chumley's shirt pocket. He stood and picked it up. Frisbee said nothing about the body when he returned to the van. Remaining in Clive Bush's line of sight for the rest of that day, he ceased his profanity and made awkward attempts to, con to converse with the other convicts. <clears throat> Chapter 5 Vladimir Frisbee prime suspect. Vladimir did not sleep that night, worried that someone might falsely connect him to Chumley's murder. He figured that the lottery ticket was worth money. There were a number of ways to win the Arizona picks, anywhere from $200 and up. He also knew that if he cashed it in, and if Chumley had told someone that he had a winner, well, if the two were linked, the finger would point straight at him. The next day, the Lottery Commission announced that Wednesday's drawing produced a single winner, and that the ticket was purchased at the Flagstaff Albertsons, but that no one as yet had stepped forward to claim the money. Ten million. Flagstaff was buzzing, everyone wondering who was the lucky person, and Vladimir thought... Could it possibly be me? More detail appeared in The Daily Spew. 
The ticket had been purchased at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, but the security cameras were down, so there were no videos made of the buyer, and Frisbee began spending the money in his head. Big news broke on Saturday. Body found in Jack Rabbit Wash. The name of the deceased was being withheld pending notification of next of kin. The death was classified as homicide, and the motive? Robbery. No other details were being released. No doubt forensics is combing the place right now, Vladimir thought, and he prayed that he had not left behind any DNA. Early morning, early Monday morning, Vladimir was awakened by persistent knocking. His wife was at her sister's, so Frisbee reluctantly got out of bed and staggered to the front door. Two country investigators flashed badges and asked to come inside. Still half asleep and in his underwear, Vlad, showing no enthusiasm, waved them in and led the detectives to a table in the kitchen. Get you guys a beer? he asked, and before they could decline, he opened one for himself. So, what can I do you for? They stayed one hour, grilling Frisbee with a barrage of questions, primarily focused on his whereabouts last Thursday between 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. Frowning and scratching his head, followed by a long pull at his beer, Vladimir belched meditatively and said, Well, let's see, I gotta think about that one. Next, Frisbee dug at his crotch, finished his beer, opened the fridge, got out another. Let's see, most Thursdays I'm at the Red Dog. Pretty sure that's where I was then. Usually get there around six and... Close her down at two. Uh, you got anybody that can corroborate? Matter of fact, I do. Two of my trash crew buddies. It was my last week of community service. They, they threw me a party of sorts. Once the detectives were gone, Vladimir breathed easier. Drank five more beers and after a visit to the restroom, went back to bed. On one hand... The investigators were disappointed that their suspect claimed to have people who could vouch for his whereabouts, and on the other hand, they were pleased to note that Frisbee, by his own admission, had placed himself on the scene when and where Dale Chumley was last seen alive. Next, they called probation services found out where Clive Bush's crew was picking up trash, and interviewed the two whom Frisbee claimed could back up his story. Unfortunately, everything their suspect said was true. To be absolutely certain, they checked with Red Dog's staff, and because Frisbee was a loyal customer and a loud drunk, impossible to miss, the bartenders remembered him quite clearly. Forensics determined that Dale had been shot elsewhere and the body moved, so they returned with a warrant and searched Frisbee's truck for the presence of blood and, once again, came away empty. Vladimir Frisbee looked less and less guilty, but still remained a person of interest. Chapter 6 the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund. Feeling that he was in the clear, Vladimir spent more and more time daydreaming about the future, what to buy, where to invest. As unlikely as it may seem, in the face of coming into so much cash, a fiscally sober side began to emerge in the normally free-spending frisbee. Upon picking up a copy of his wife's Lutheran lifestyle magazine, he noted approvingly that the feature article detailed the life of a rising young phenom in the world of high finance. Damien Hyde was the founder and the brains behind the Lutheran Strategic Partners Hedge Fund, which had posted incredible gains the previous year and was on pace to exceed last year's totals. The article went on about technicals such as split strike conversion conversion strategies and several others which frisbee did not understand but which sounded pretty good to him the man had turned investors into millionaires 
several of whom had provided glowing testimonials, including one from Dick Cheney. Cheney had priors, including two DUIs, and had reportedly shot his own attorney. And as such, Vladimir saw the man as a kindred spirit closely aligned with his own inclinations. No doubt a veteran beer drinker, Frisbee said to himself approvingly. Vladimir phoned the hedge fund's 800 number and asked for more details. Five days later, a large envelope arrived with glossy photos, mainly extolling Hyde's financial triumphs. Several featured Damien Hyde alongside famous people, shaking hands with the likes of Alan Greenspan, Donald Trump, and Carl Icahn. A previous brochure had included Hyde with Bertie Madoff, but was eliminated for obvious reasons. Uh, Marianne Craig Moore was born in 1887. Uh, she died in the 70s. She died in 1972. She was an American modernist poet, critic, translator, and editor. Her poetry is noted for innovation, irony, and wit. Marianne Moore's innovative style is easily compared to that of E.E. E. Cummings, so that I wonder if he was inspired by her poetry or uh, was she inspired by his? There seems to be some crossover of influence there. Um, Marianne Moore is at ease with her free verse, her unconventional form of words placed on the page while totally ignoring typical stanza placement and lined placement and any kind of form or style. Also, like E.E. E. Cummings, she looks at a thing, just a common, everyday thing that all of us have looked at, but she sees it in a way that no one else has seen it. She puts that on the page any way she wants. I think a funny um, illustration, I suppose is the right way to, to, to phrase that, a funny illustration of exactly that is the name of our first poem is called Poetry. Uh, poetry was first published in 1919 by the literary magazine Others, a magazine of the new verse. It was the lead poem of the final issue of the magazine. It's interesting to note that Moore published many other versions of this same poem during her lifetime. I, I gotta wonder uh, when it's something like that, like the, the lead poem of the, the final issue of, of a magazine, you know, how often, how often do they know, in this case, did they know that that was the final issue of the magazine at the time? I mean, if they did, it's probably very clearly printed in there. Um, just as, a musician as an artist, as a performing artist. I, I've been taking stock in my life of how often the last time a performer does a particular show, they don't realize that that was the last time that they were gonna perform in that way. This isn't the, the case for plays, uh, which have a scheduled run. This isn't the case for marching seasons, for, um, same thing, there's a calendar and it's rigorously set and everybody knows going in what the calendar is. But, um, yeah, just wonder in the case of that magazine. This poem by Marianne Craig Moore is called Poetry. I too dislike it. There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it one discovers that there is in it, after all, a place for the genuine. Hands that can grasp, eyes that can dilate, hair that can rise if it must. These things are important not because a high-sounding interpretation can be put upon them, but because they are useful. 
when they become so derivative as to become unintelligible, the same thing may be said for all of us, that we do not admire what we cannot understand. The bat holding on upside down, or in quest of something to eat. Elephants pushing, a wild horse taking a roll, a tireless wolf under a tree, the immovable critic twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea, the baseball fan, the statistician. Case after case could be cited, did one wish it. Nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. All these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction, however. When dragged into prominence by half-poets, the result is not poetry. Nor till the autocrats among us can be literalists of the imagination, above insolence and triviality, and can present for inspection imaginary gardens with real toads. Shall we have it? In the meantime, if you demand on one hand, in defiance of their opinion, the raw material of poetry in all its rawness, and that which is on the other hand genuine, then you are interested in poetry. This poem is called Is Your Town Nineveh? Why so desolate? And why multiply in phantasmagoria about fishes what disgusts you? Could not all personal upheaval in the name of freedom be tabooed? Is it Nineveh? And are you, Jonah, in the sweltering east wind of your wishes? I myself have stood there by the aquarium, looking at the Statue of Liberty. This time, <clears throat> this poem is called England by Marianne C. Moore. With its baby rivers and little towns, each with its abbey or its cathedral, with voices, one voice perhaps, echoing through the transept, the criterion of suitability and convenience. And Italy, with its equal shores, contriving an epicureanism from which the grossness has been extracted, and Greece with its goats and its gourds, the nest of modified illusions, and France, the chrysalis of the nocturnal butterfly, and whose product's mystery of construction diverts one from what was originally one's object. Substance at the core, and the East with its snails, its emotional shorthand and jade cockroaches, its rock crystal, and its imperturbability, all of museum quality. In America, where there is the little old ramshackle Victoria in the south, where cigars are smoked on the street in the north, where there are no proofreaders, no silkworms, no digressions, the wild man's land, grassless, linkless, languageless country in which letters are written not in Spanish, not in Greek, not in Latin, not in shorthand, but in a plain American, which cats and dogs can read. The letter A in psalm and calm when pronounced with the sound of an A in candle is very noticeable, but why should continents of misapprehension have to be accounted for by the fact. Does it follow that because there are poisonous toadstools which resemble mushrooms, both are dangerous? In the case of meddlesomeness, which may be mistaken for appetite, of heat which may appear to be haste, no conclusions may be drawn. To have misapprehended the matter is to have confessed that one has not looked far enough. The sublimated wisdom of China 
Egyptian discernment, the cataclysmic torrent of emotion compressed in the verbs of the Hebrew language, the books of the man who is able to say, I envy nobody but him and him only who catches more fish than I do. The flower and fruit of all that noted superiority should one not have stumbled upon it in America, one must one imagine that it is not there? It has never been confined to one locality. This poem is called Roses Only by Marianne C. Moore. You do not seem to realize that beauty is a liability rather than an asset. That in view of the fact that spirit creates form, we are justified in supposing that you must have brains. For you, a symbol of the unit, stiff and sharp, conscious of surpassing by dint of native superiority and liking for everything self-dependent, anything an ambitious civilization might produce. For you, unaided to attempt through sheer reserve to confute presumptions resulting from observation is idle. You cannot make us think you a delightful happen so. But, Rose, if you are brilliant, it is not because your petals are the without which nothing of preeminence. You would look, minus thorns, like a, what is this, a mere peculiarity. You're not proof against a worm, the elements, or mildew, but what about the predatory hand? What is brilliance without coordination? Guarding the infinitesimal pieces of your mind, compelling audience to the remark that it is better to be forgotten than to be remembered too violently. Your thorns are the best part of you. And now for Ask Hunter Anything, where I answer questions submitted by you, the viewers. Uh, please know that these episodes are live streamed on the Hunter's Acoustic Cabin YouTube channel every Monday evening at 9 o'clock California time uh, before they're made into this broadcast version. So you may hear reference to those who um, chat with me during my answers. And uh, hey, if you have a question that uh, you would like answered on Fireside Tales for Wolfgang, email me using the email address askhunteranything at gmail.com. It's just a life's hobby, passion, ambition, whatever you want to call it of mine. I'm just a really big fan of really good questions. Spent my entire life cultivating the best questions that I could possibly find. And I'd like to hear what questions that you have that you'd put into that category. Uh, Kim from Pasadena asked, what causes an allergy to cats or dogs? What is happening in the body? Thank you for your question, Kim. Um, so allergies in particular in human physiology are um, a, the body's overreaction to something that doesn't really need to defend itself against. So the body is making allergies or an allergic response when it uh, senses some kind of foreign entity or what it interp interprets as a foreign entity and attacks that foreign ent entity with the immune system. So um, it must be very similar in dogs, but in cats, I know that uh, people can be allergic to either of two different proteins found in cat saliva or in cat dander. And people that you and I have known all our lives that are extremely allergic to cats, frequently they're allergic to both of those proteins. So they're kind of 
getting it coming and going, as it were. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that is what is going on, is the, the body is overreacting to a particular protein in, uh, that the cat's biology makes. Um, when you get hypoallergenic pets, frequently what's going on is uh, they don't have that uh, protein um, coming out in the, uh, in the fur. Like a lot of times um, it's dogs with hair, for example, as a hypoallergenic pet as opposed to uh, a dog with fur. There are a few differences in that, but the important one is uh, the absence of that particular protein. And another Ask Hunter Anything question. Remember, you can submit your questions too by using the email address askhunteranything at gmail.com. Corey from Chicago. When, when can I see the Milky Way in the night sky from where I am in the Midwest? Corey from Illinois. Well, Corey, thank you for your question. Um, be you my relative or not. So, I, so first, I, I just want to like acknowledge what the Milky Way is. We didn't really, I, I don't know if you, if you got that. So, our galaxy, the galaxy that we reside in, is called the Milky Way. And um, we are sitting in what they referred to in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as a quaint little backwater place in the unfashionable part of the galaxy. So we're, we're way away from the center, is what I'm getting at. And when you look up into the night sky and you see the Milky Way, you're looking at the bulk of the rest of our local galaxy. But you're looking at it edge on and from way out here in the suburbs, as it were, looking at it from the side. And you can see very obviously from the orientation in the sky of the Milky Way that neither the Earth nor the plane of the solar system line up with the plane that the Milky Way is in. Um, but the short answer to your question, when can I see the Milky Way in the night sky from where I am in the Midwest? Your best times are June through August, June, July, August. Um, and the less moon that is present, the more you'll be able to see. So if you got a, um, a moon tracking app, you're going to want to look for nights with a new moon and obviously clear weather. If you're looking for Milky Way photography, for example. Thanks for the question, Corey. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. You can view more of my work at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Produced by GWC Productions. In memory of Wolfgang Beastly. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99.